I was born in Elberton, Georgia. My daddy had met my mother um, at a, a um, clothing store that her um, uncle owned. Uh, my daddy was a mercantile salesman and he traveled a lot. So he said when he saw Mama, said she was sitting in front of one of these big three-way mirrors just admiring herself and said she was so beautiful, he just could not take his eyes off of her. And here I am. <laughs> they got married and they lived there about a year. And he wanted to come home. He was born at Rural Hall Plantation um, on Black River, an old rice plantation. And uh, he was homesick. And um, so they moved um, back to King Street. That's where his home office was. And from there, um, on into um, Georgetown. Every weekend, we went out to the plantation. And Daddy worked. Now, this was during the Great Depression. He worked, and my mother worked at a courthouse. And um, they took me down to the plantation and left me there, so I more or less stayed with my man Papa off and on all my life until I got to be a teenager. After school, I got married, and I have three children. Uh, I married Joseph Carter from Georgetown, and he was um, originally from Hemingway County, and um, Woodrow Carter, the, uh, a previous sheriff of Georgetown, was his um, daddy's brother. He worked in a national paper company. But we had three children, Julie, Patricia, she's the oldest you just met, and um, then uh, my son Joey, Joseph E. Carter Jr., and then my baby daughter, Candace Bruce, she lives in Washington. And they're three great kids, I love them to death, and I, I'm younger than they are though. Now you know what's so pitiful? I'm 85 years old, and my heart's 16, it drives me crazy as a dodo. <laughs> I was spoiled to death, and I was a little girl, but I remember sliding down the banister, and uh, Dr. and Mrs. Frank Sloan from Myrtle Beach owned the place now. And I went out to see it not too long ago, and it's beautiful. It is gorgeous, beautiful, it, it's prettier than anything I've ever seen. And, uh, but the banister's not painted. And I said, I did that. Oh, I was so glad they didn't paint that banister. But, um, Mama, um, she taught us all how to, um, uh, uh, me and my cousin Jane Evans from King Street, she taught us how to walk. She taught us how to sit like a lady with your legs crossed at the ankles and how to stand and how to speak. Uh, they taught us how to embroidery, uh, the little um, boil pillowcases and then put lace around them. And she taught us how to, um, um, she didn't teach, but but we would I would crawl under the frames of the quilts, and they would have quilting parties, and I would watch them quilt. The men and the women went early in the morning, and they took their babies, and they had big baskets like this, a flat baskets, and they would have a quilt or some kind of comfort in it, and they'd have these little bags. Um, they would hold either cornbread or biscuits and they'd be wetted down with water and then rolled in sugar and tied real tight with that, um, a string, you know, that cloth around it. Well, they were called sugar tits. And I bet I stole a many and went and sucked on it for the... <laughs> when the mothers were in the field, one mother would go this way and there was a basket of babies at that end too. And, and, the, and the other mother would be coming this way. Well, if this mother's baby was crying and hungry, and this mother here had a baby, she would nurse the baby for her. And they took turns uh, nursing their babies. And I think that was a wonderful thing. We had a big bell in the yard, and it would ring at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, the, uh, the women in the kitchen, my precious sweet mom, Becca, she was a heavy woman and she was in charge of the kitchen. And um, she had two or three women working with her and they'd cook the meals for the workers. And um, um, the bell would ring and they would come out of the fields and um, 
Papa, he was on a ho big white horse, speck a speckled horse, and I would run down that lane just as fast as my little feet would carry me, and, and one of the men would pick me up and put me up there in front of Papa. Later on in life, I told um, Papa, I said, I feel like the Queen of Sheba. And, and my daddy said, well, you know, the Queen of Sheba was a black woman and said she was a beautiful woman. And I think he told me her name was Candace, but he read a lot, you know. But um, we were all treated, so, all treated so good. When the men and women got paid by the week, um, Papa, they would uh, come on uh, Saturday and um, they would uh, in a line and he would be on the steps, you know, on, on the porch at the head, at the top step. Um, and uh, he would um, give them their salary and maybe a piece of meat, you know, because they had a, um, in the pantry behind the kitchen, he kept um, uh, salted down meat and um, sausage and stuff hanging from the ceiling. And, and hams and things like that. And, um, but the riverboat, he got his, most of his um, merchandise by riverboat, and uh, he would always get fruit, always have fruit in the closet underneath the stairway, and especially those stalks of bananas. They, ooh, I would open that door all the time just to smell the bananas. Well, anyway, uh, he would have oranges and apples, whatever was in seasons. And you know, we all, I played with the little children, we were together, we were together all the time, just like family. And when they were in the yard, I was in the yard. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Papa, as he paid the, the men, and um, I can't remember seeing the women, but they got paid too, but um, he paid the men, but the men had the little children with them. And he would have um, a basket of fruit, and he'd say, Betty Jane, give you a friend the fruit, you know, so I'd pass out the fruit. And uh, that made me happy, and uh, they were happy too. And um, it was a wonderful thing. We loved those people, and they acted like they loved us, but we loved them. This was years and years and years ago. Uh, there was no way of sealing houses for them out there. They would have, um, if there are any old magazine or newspaper, they would put paste on it, and they made the paste out of water and flour. And I made some too, for many a day to make scrapbooks. But they've had their walls, um, that on their walls to cover the cracks to keep the cold wind out and, and mosquitoes. And um, I thought it was beautiful. I, I just couldn't wait to go in the next one to see what all they've had, you know. But, um, um, and I've eaten many a potato off of their stoves, keep, they were keeping warm. There's nothing more comforting than to smell the smoke burning through the woods at night and to keep the mosquitoes, you know, because no glass windows in homes and stuff like that. Now, the big house uh, at Rural Hall, it did have um, um, screens in the bottom. But I, if I remember, I don't think they had screens in the top uh, upstairs. Uh, Daddy, and um, we often wondered why, but Daddy and Archibald Rutledge of the Hampton Plantation, um, he told Daddy one time that um, a mosquito didn't fly any higher than 32 feet. Now, I don't know if that's true or false, but I'm telling you. <laughs> Daddy and Archibald were great friends. They would put the leaves there and put a little um, uh, wet of cloth or something so that it would smoke, and that's what drove the mosquitoes. And they, each little house had that, you know. They had their own gardens in the back, and, and um, when they'd work in the morning, I don't remember them working in the afternoon, but I think I heard Papa say one time that y'all go home and rest now. And he said, uh, because the sun's too hot, and we'll go back in the field later on in the evening. And, um, and he was telling the, the uh, colored women, he said, um, um, and take care of your garden. Make sure it gets plenty of water. Now, Papa had an artesian well at the big house, and I, I don't know how they, if they had wells or not. I don't remember going in the backyards. But um, the mama and Mumbeka, um, they would put me, at, you know, whenever you have a baby born 
and it grows up a little, say, to get about two or three years old. Well, they put another child, like the white child's two or three, and then the black child, he's about, or he or she is about two or three years older than the baby, and they would take care, and they would teach the baby how to do what they knew. And, um, but Mamma, they didn't keep the chickens in the yard or anything like that. But now when the old hen had the little biddies, they would let the old hen come in the yard with the biddies. And she said, all right, now she'd give us good talking to. And they wanted us to hold the biddies and get to know the little animals. But anyway, they said, uh, now, um, watch out for the old hawks. Don't let the hawks get the biddies. And I saw we were just scared to death. But now, you know what? The old hen saw the hawk before the children saw it. Because once she raised her um, feathers like that, the little bit is just flying underneath her bed. Wonderful, wonderful. They had a lot of hunts there, especially in the winter time. And they just had, um, Mamma -Mam would feed the people that were hunting. And um, they always had plenty of company. Wonderful meals around that table. One of the things that, um, I don't know how to cook now. <laughs> there was a patch of mud at the gate, at, at the big house. And um, they took us, and me and the little children, and they dug up the clay, clay, I said mud, golly, mud, well, clay. And they taught us how to make little plates out of it and little pots and pans. And they had a piece of wood or brick or something. They would sit them on there, and they'd say, don't touch them now, let them cook. The sun's going to cook them, and then you can have something to play with, to cook yourself, you know. And we just thought that was wonderful. But sometimes we didn't wait till it got <laughs> done, you know, we had to, just had to touch them. They had an old wagon in the yard under the oak trees. And um, us children would walk up the wagon tongue and sit in the wagon and, and just had the best time. We'd pretend all kind of things. And then Mama and Mumbeka and some of the other ladies would take us down to the dock. Um, and we'd fish. We sat on the dock and we'd fish. And um, Mamma's garden was down that way too, and she had a fence around it to keep the deer and the rabbits and things out of it. And uh, of the big house, it had a fence around it, the yard and the gatehouse, it was all in there. And talking about the gatehouse, um, um, one time we got caught out in the storm, me and this little girl called Nene. And um, she had a little brother, and we were taking care of him. We were just having the best time, because I was holding that baby. I loved the little colored babies. I just loved them, and uh, I still love them. And, and what happens is um, it started raining and it turned into a storm. So the, um, Mom Becca yelled out of the house, go in the house, go in the house. So we went in the house, and we were so afraid the thunder was just and lightning, it was clapping, it was terrible, and uh, we jumped in the bed. And I want you to know that was the most wonderful smell I have ever smelled. They have a uh, clean hay or, or straw or something like that. But it was wonderful. I begged to have one of those mattresses for a long time. Getting back to the big house, Mamma had a pump organ in her living room. Parlor. They had a parlor. And she had this old rocking chair and she had made a little black satin pillar to go in the bottom with pretty little uh, colorful flowers in it. I thought that was beautiful. Well, one day, um, my grandmother, uh, my daddy and his brother, they were always playing games and tricking people and stuff like that. So um, uh, daddy said, Tisty, come on, I want you to play the organ for me. And I love that because they made me quit playing it so many times. But I was pumping with my feet, trying to play the organ, you know. And all of a sudden, Uncle Tom, the youngest brother, jumped out and said, boo. And I screamed and had a fit. And um, um, Mamma came running in there. She said, you rascals, what have you done to her? <laughs> oh, they had big parties at, on the weekend. And Daddy played the harp and he played the fiddle. And um, there were other people playing and singing and just having, and, and this thing of eggnog on the dog, on dog riding and all that. <laughs> I saw him, I know about that. <laughs>
but they were just having so much fun and dancing in the hall and all and family. It was mostly family and uh, like Pat McCleary and, and um, that's daddy's first cousin and Aunt Bertie McCleary and uh, my grandmother were sisters and I've got pictures I'll show you. And, um, they, they, and not only that, and Harry Holiday, Henry Holiday too, um, they just had fun, but they were devilish. It was those boys were really, really devilish. Uh, we'd go down to the river, but now we couldn't, uh, we didn't dare walk through the canes. You know, they were sharp and alligators and snakes and things like that. But um, down near the river, there was a meadow. Uh, well, I say meadow, it had trees, pine trees. And the men would go hunting, and they had their satchel over their shoulder, you know, that put the game in. And um, now the little girls didn't carry anything. They could have carried a little jug of water or something, but the little boys, they all had um, crocus sacks. Now, they don't say crocus sacks now. A lot of people don't know what a crocus sack is, but they call them burlap bags, you know. <laughs> There's nothing any better than a good old crook of that. We'd walk out on the edge of the ditches and pick um, blackberries and huckleberries is what they call them, and huckleberries. And um, uh, that was a fun thing to do. And my daddy said, Tisty, let me, I want to show you something. He said, you walk real slow and I'm going to go ahead of you. Now don't, me, he said, you stand still, I'll come and uh, I'll call you. So um, he called me in a few minutes, and we he had found a piece of broken glass by the fence where, you know, maybe somebody had a jaw pickles or something, might have broken them. And um, so he called me, and he said, look, I think I found a doodle bug hill. And he said, take your finger and just kind of press it like this, and um, um, see what you find. So I did. And beneath that was the most beautiful um, green grass with a little, uh, I don't know if it was a little yellow flower or a little blue flower, but there's always a little flower that he had found along the fence. And uh, put in a, he said, we've got, a, I found a magic garden, a secret garden. And I thought that was wonderful and he made those for the rest of my life and always called me to come see. So I did that. And Right on up till I got married, looked at my secret garden. I thought that was, he was a child in, at heart, really and truly. But now we had, we had moved to Georgetown in a different area and we're going to the Baptist church. And my little brother, Billy, think, who thinks he knows everything now, he, uh, <laughs> the Sunday school teacher asked him his name and he asked, um, what was his mama's name? And he told him, he asked her, what's your daddy's name? And he couldn't think. He said, oh, Mom, what's your daddy's name? And he couldn't think. He says, oh, what does your mama call your daddy? And he said, jackass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen um, molasses made with the, with the mule going round and round, you know. I've seen that done. And, um, um, and we loved that sugar cane at Christmas time. Daddy used to tell us that he did Mr. Santa Claus, Mr. and Miss Santa Claus took them to the North Pole. And so every Christmas Eve, we'd all get in the bed with Daddy and he'd tell us that story over and over. And he'd say, don't stick your feet out from under cover now. Uh, Santa Claus will pop your toes and had us so scared we didn't move all night long. We moved to King Street for some reason. I don't, I can't remember right now why. Well, it was during the Great Depression. But now, Mama did have a job at the courthouse at that time, and my brother Billy was born during that time. I started school there. So that was the end of a lot of rural hall for me, except on the weekends when the men went hunting. I was, I started school, and I, I was so proud of myself, and, um, and uh, Mama had me all dressed up, and I had a little tin can. It looked like a little, uh, little round can with a little handle. My lunch was in it. And um, so at lunchtime, uh, recess, these little girls, and I know them well, their last name was all Brooks, and um, 
the um, um, we act, they acted like they loved me to death. We were all good friends. Now at lunchtime they came out and they said, well, let's, oh, let's eat our lunch together. So they had these pretty little lunch boxes with things all over them. And they pulled all, uh, out these sandwiches wrapped in nice paper, you know. And um, I pulled mine out. I don't know if it was even wrapped up, but I had a biscuit and, and sausage between it or something like that. And um, then the little girl started singing, biscuit eater, biscuit eater. And I went behind the tree and I cried. <laughs> But the next day I went to school, I had a lunchbox, I'll tell you. <laughs> but it was pitiful. It was sad. And, um, but they were still my friends, you know, but that hurt me so bad. So finally, when we moved to Georgetown, um, um, we lived at 519 High Market Street. And then most, and most of my growing up was in that house. It was one block down from the jailhouse and Virginia Skinner and her daddy, he was sheriff. I spent the night with her many a night in the jail. <laughs> we had the most fun. When I would walk home from school, um, sometimes I would say, um, I wish I was rich. I'd eat all the white bread and mayonnaise I can get my hands on. <laughs> mayonnaise sandwiches. But um, I knew everybody on the street. We all, and Aunt Bertie McClay would live there too. But now getting back to um, when I was much younger, before High Market Street was um, paved, I was at Aunt Bertie's visiting her granddaughter, little Virginia, and her mother was um, from Virginia. So, and um, she would come visit Aunt Bertie and Aunt, they would send for me. So um, Aunt Bertie came running to the road. The tractor was coming down the road, you know, was mowing the, um, leveling it out to paved. And um, I'll never forget that, but she was just scared to death. Uncle Cleve, her husband, um, he was a great guy, and every, everybody had a lot of respect for him and all that, but um, he was a little stingy. Well, there was a lot of stingy people back then. <laughs> and um, so he was going on a trip. He said, don't kill any chickens till I get back. Don't, don't kill any chickens. And, okay, okay. So uh, Salkless and, um, and um, Pat and, and the rest of the children, they wanted some ch a chicken pearl or something. So um, Aunt Bertie cooked the chicken, and it was time for Uncle Cleve to come back. And they said, oh, what are we going to do? He's going to count those chickens. We, we don't know what to do. So Daddy and Saltus, they were both rascals. Well, the whole family was rascals. And um, they went hunting, and they killed an old owl and brought it back to Aunt Bertie, and she cooked it. She made a pearl out of it, and Uncle Cleve ate it. He said, that's the best darn chicken he ever ate in his life. <laughs> you know, it was a fun family. They were always pulling tricks on each other and doing things. And one time there was a funeral, a, a, a family funeral, and uh, most of the families buried up at Union Cemetery. And um, Saltus was one of the pallbearers, and he got too close to the grave and fell in. <laughs> And they had to stop the funeral and laugh and pull the salters out. <laughs>
um, he would drive um, the um, maids around, and, and he drove Mr. Huntington all over the world because he was very interested in plantations. Daddy knew all the plantations because whenever you live on a plantation, you associate with the other plantations, and they have parties. All the, they just have the best time, and they have them for children, and they have them for their help. But um, one night, Daddy came home a little early, and uh, he was with the zookeeper. And he told me that he had come to get me, to carry me to Florence with him, to get the black, first black bear that would be in the new zoo. Oh, I was so proud of myself and scared to death coming home, you know. Um, they had a heavy metal door between, uh, but, uh, between us and the um, but I was afraid he was going to poke me with a, one of those holes. So now they didn't have the park furnished all that much. They just had maybe a um, otter and a wood stalk or something like that. Now there was a fenced in place with a lot of deer and they had one or two red fox. But um, they had the old trees there and they still had the vines in them. I like that better than I like what I see now, although it's beautiful. But we would get on the vines and swing and play Tarzan, you know. That was fun. And one day, Mr. Huntington and Daddy and myself, we were walking um, in the gardens, and you know that pool they have in that house? Well, uh, Mr. Huntington told me that, I don't know if he said if it was in Greece or where it was, but he said they used to fill it with milk for all the ladies and to, um, help their skin. They'd take milk baths. So I, I was so proud that I knew that. Bill Skinner was gatekeeper. He held, had a daughter named Ann and Jan. And I spent the night with them, oh, I bet 50 or 60 nights while they worked there, you know. I was young, very young, and Daddy would take me with him. They had seen, now here's why. They, Papa had my man, Papa had retired. He was sick, he was about in his late 80s. And they moved to a house on the corner of St. James Street and Front Street, and it was called the Octangle House. Well, they lived there several years. And uh, uh, Mr. Ford um, on Front Street that had Ford's store, he was a good friend of Pepe's. Well, Pepe had a lot of good friends because he knew so many people. Whenever the shrimp boats would come in, Rennie Cthulhu was one of Daddy's best friends, too. He was, he was a card. <laughs> he and Daddy were two of a kind. <laughs> and, um, but the shrimp boats would start to come in, and the little black boys would run down the street and say, shrimp boat coming, shrimp boat coming. And the whole block, so you could just see everybody, the colored people coming, black people coming. And, um, um, and that way they picked the heads off of the shrimp because there wasn't any jobs for them then. The mill hadn't come yet, but it was on this way. <laughs> and the, uh, but they had their supper, and we had ours too. We all were so happy to see the boats come in. I was uh, riding my cousin's tricycle, and my daddy came by and with Mr. Hunt, Mr. and Miss Huntington, and he had on the cap. Now, daddy had to wear boots up to his knees, and um, I would help him pull those boots off at night. When he came home, he had an old boot jack, but I thought that was wonderful. And I, oh, I was so proud of him and that hat and those boots. But um, I saw him go by and I said, hey, daddy, hey, daddy. And he didn't look my way, did not look my way. So that night when he came home, he said, Tisty, old dad saw you. But he said, I was working and I couldn't say anything. And so the next day, he took me to work with him. And uh, Miss Huntington came out and took me by the hand, took me into Adelaide and showed me everything she could show me. And they treated me like I was a special doll for the rest of the day. And oftentimes, Daddy would take me to work with him. And um, she, was, she was great. And, he, and Mr. Huntington was too, but he was always busy, mostly. And um, now he would have Daddy over there at night. Daddy knew a lot to tell him he didn't ramble like I'm rambling. But he told about, you know, his life as a child and the plantations and about his, all the friends that he had. And um, 
Now, Archibald Rutledge was Daddy's favorite friend, and he wrote children's books. And um, it's and I told you now, when a ch boy child is born, they have a little boy older than him to take care of him. The same with the little girls, the little girl child. And um, but um, his mother had another little boy, and uh, he, the boy, little boy was brain damaged. Just something was wrong with him. And his mother was so disheartened and disappointed, she never came downstairs again. And she died in the room without ever coming out of the house again. And, um, but Archie and the, and the boy that um, was Archie's best friend raised the little boy. And they had to do something to entertain him. So Archie started thinking up all these stories and would tell the little boy the stories. Now, my daddy was a great storyteller, too. He conned me a lot of times. <laughs> no, he was a wonderful storyteller also. But Archibald was a professional and he wrote the stories and all. John Vereen and, um, oh, let me see, Whit Haynes and um, one more, Tom Yorkie. They would all get together and on, on come to our house and cook and tell tales, you could sit around, and I was in with them because they sang afterwards. And I was always singing, too. At that time, I thought I could sing off, but after having my babies, my voice cracked. And I didn't. <laughs> so I sing like a little kitten mew in now. <laughs> and Daddy, everybody loved him because he was full of, full of himself, and he was always joking, and he always had a lot to tell. Like when he was a little boy and they would go coon hunting and um, they would make the little color boys climb up and get the coon out the tree because they didn't want to be scratched. <laughs> daddy said that when he was a little boy that um, his daddy used to take him and other people would bring their friends to look at the alligator. They had an alligator pond there and um, they, had, um, they came to look at the alligators. Now, I worked at a bank for 25 years or longer, about 28 years, and uh, Miss Marie St. Germain was one of my customers. I took her out to lunch one day, and a section of the railroad had sunk behind her house. And she told me there was a hidden, there was an underground river there, and she said that her daddy bought, uh, bought that piece of land and built the house, and when he built the house, he built it on a bluff of the river. So the river was there. They had a dock. They had a boat. There was fish in the river. And um, I guess an arm of the Oh, uh, we lived at 120 Dozier Street at one time. And um, when it was raining, it, that place would, would absolutely flood. But they did have a water tank, and that water tank had um, um, artesian water. And um, so it, it ran dry, so it's got to be a hole down there somewhere. I do remember the train station also. Precious. It was so nice. I rode, um, my mother had been to Georgia to see her people, and she, we came back by Florence. And uh, Florence, we took, we took a train from Florence and came through King Street and went on to Georgetown and got off at that little station. And Abe Vogel had a, a hotel over his store at that time. So we may have spent the night there till we could have gotten to Rural Hall, you know. She came to church one day. She said, how do y'all like my new skirt? She was a little tiny thing. Oh, we like it. She said, this is one leg of daddy's pants. And she made well, her sister, uh, 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 the other leg, her skirt, made a skirt out of two legs. And we just thought that was wonderful. But she's so crazy. She, she's so sweet. I love Virginia, and we're about to have gone. Mac, let's see, Dan Daniels. Did she tell you about us swinging out on the vines? playing Tarzan. Okay. Well, they had a, a vine over near his, where he lived. And, but my mother and his mother were good friends. And then the Orvins lived on that street, and they were related to my aunt um, Grace Holliday, who married Uncle Tom. I was between seven and eight years old at the time. And um, um, I was coming home from school, and it was raining. And this was the time that the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped and died. 
And uh, so they told me not to ever get in a car with someone. So I've had somebody stop by twice in a black car and uh, I, I just shook my head and ran. And uh, so um, uh, another day, soon after the first time, this man, uh, he's very tall and very skinny, and um, he had on a black hat and a black umbrella and a coat down to here, and he was walking right behind me. If I walk fast, he walked fast. If I crossed the street, he crossed the street. I crossed the street again, he crossed the street. So, um, I um, crossed back to the street and I was at home. My house was across the street at that time. This was at 519 Highmarket. And um, I ran in the house and I told Mama, I said, some man is following me. She and the um, housekeeper was with her. And um, um, so they ran out in the backyard to look to see if they saw anything and they found him. He was hid up between the chimney and the house. The colored woman found him. She found him. And I uh, started calling Mama, and the man took off and started running. Well, Daddy, his heart just about stopped when he heard it because they were afraid that somebody was trying to kidnap me. And um, they knew that Daddy worked for Mr. Huntington. They knew I was there half the time. And um, so, um, Daddy and Mr. Huntington had a talk, and uh, Daddy told him, he said, Mr. Huntington, he said, I love my job to death, but he said, I've got to go home and take care of my children, because Daddy had all kind of hours. He didn't get home till way after dark sometimes, but when he did come home, he always came home with an armful of stuff that Mr. and Ms. Huntington would send, and we had an old um, wood stove at that time. And um, that's the times when you run down the street after the ice wagon and jump on it. Get now that's before they paved the dirt. I would run down the street and grab a piece of ice off the wagon. I was in love with the ice man. He was 14. <laughs> Dalton Powell. <laughs> nice man. He made a good father and a nice husband way years and years gone by. Daddy. Um, had a hard time accepting another job, you know, he's um, tried all kind of things. And I don't ask me what he ended up with insurance for the time being, I think. But um, we went back to Adelaide all the time, and Mr. Huntington would send for him. But now let me tell you, um, we would go to parties at Mr. Baruch's, and um, he invited the family, the children, and everybody. They had not completed the brick house, but they were building it. And um, they had the porch already, um, <laughs> what? It, the foundation was down, but they didn't have it filled with sand or dirt or anything like that, no top on it. So I was, I was walking around the edge of the foundation, you know, the old colored people were like, get off there, child. Get off there, you're going to fall. So, but what they did, they um, had wagons full of hay or straw or something. I don't know what, which one it was. But then they had, um, um, uh, you climb up those wagons and there's a haystack there on, on the straight pole. You jump on it and you slide down the haystack. They put more hay or straw or whatever it was. And you kept on playing. But now behind the houses, they had, um, it looked like picnic tables, and they were just full of, there were a lot of people there, you know, just big crowds of people. But the children played off from them, kind of to the side. But that was a good thing to do. So he got to be real good friends with Mr. Baruch, and, da and uh, Daddy could tell him stories about growing up and plantation life and things, and they were all interested at that time. Uh, so Mrs. Baruch and Daddy got to be good friends, uh, along with Mr. Uh, Huntington. And um, they always met, too, down at Mr. Ford's store. And, um, but uh, one day Mr. Brooks said, Mr. Holliday, he said, I'm going back north, but he said, I want you to feel free to use my waters at any time. He said, you're free to use my everything I have. Come on over. So Daddy said, thank you, sir. And um, so one day he got an old colored fella and uh, Tom from Dunbar, and he said, um, Mr. Baruch said I could go in his waters at any time, and he said, let's go catch a few 
of some kind of fish. And um, so they had just put the poles out, and Daddy said he heard the yacht coming. And he said, Tom, said, pull the reels up. He said, let's turn around and meet Mr. Baruch and uh, say good morning to him. So um, they pulled up the reels and turned around. About that time, the yacht came around the bend of the river, and it had four men on the front of it, and they had guns, and they were pointed at them. And Daddy said it scared him so much that his heart was just doing like that. He was so afraid. And uh, Mr. Baruch had, was coming out of the door, and he said, Good morning, Mr. Holiday. We were just talking about you. He said, I'm so glad to see you. Y'all catching anything? And here comes another man out right behind Mr. Baruch. And he said, By the way, this is my good friend, President Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt. And Daddy said he tipped his hat, and he says, How do you do, sir? He, and uh, Mr. Rose, uh, President Roosevelt said, Mr. Holliday, I've heard so many tales about you. He said, we've just got to have a talk. And, um, but anyway, Mr. Baruch said, well, the tide will soon be changing. We better go on and we'll see you later. And Daddy said, okay. And uh, um, the boat went on and he said, Tom, turn this thing around. And he said, let's we get the hell out of here. <laughs> He said, I like to look at them guns. <laughs> but he went, to, he kept on, he was friends with them till the day he died. And I'm not saying it just to be saying it, but my daddy had the biggest funeral in Georgetown anybody ever had. Because he loved everybody. And they loved him back. He was always doing something. He would give anything. If he had something, he'd give it to somebody else. You know, if, whoever needed it. And uh, black and white, when we got up around Union, um, um, a lot of the colored people up there were, had, was lying in the road with their arms, of, hat across their chest and their head bowed as we went by. And I cried my heart out because I knew them since that. A lot of good people there. Well, there's good and bad everywhere, you know. But uh, Daddy showed no difference. He loved everybody and did everything he could. We'd give the last cent he had away. I mean, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, but we got by. Had plenty of game to eat <laughs> and fish to fry. We would go down on Sundays. Um, a lot of men uh, would go down and take the little children on Sundays to the ferry and um, uh, to see who was going to ride, who was going to go across and all that. And, the, and they would um, throw dimes and um, nickels and pennies, and uh, they would dance. And that was nice, but when you get to the other side of the ferry, that was a bunch of sand, and you never seen so many sand bogs in your life. When we were down in the ferry, at Brown's Ferry, uh, we could see alligators swimming toward the ferry, and this um, old black man, colored man, he would had a, a um, chain, and he was standing, he'd pull you across, and um, there was a, it, a hill you had at Brown's Ferry at that time. It was hilly, and you would have to go down between the shoulders of the dirt, you know, to get to the river. And there was a little house up there, a little small house. And years later, Daddy said, "I almost married that woman that lived in that house." <laughs> he said, "Don't tell your mama." <laughs> and Mama, God bless her precious heart, she had. Um, um, a little bottle of perfume, and it had a little uh, uh, satin string with little fringe on it. And she said, Betty Jane, this is a bottle of perfume your daddy bought for his girlfriend when he was 18 years old in high school, went to Union High School. And um, she said, I said, well, he didn't give it to her. She said, no. She said, the darn fool opened it to smell it. And said, you can't give it away <laughs> after you open it. <laughs> They had an outside toilet, and it was really nice. It was a big um, square building, and it had four or five seats, but built very low, like a chair. And they had straw underneath, and the open in the back. And uh, they had a shelf with um, a beautiful ceramic pitcher, two of them, and the basins. 
and they were had uh, they were pink, white, pink and white with the gold um, decoration in between them. You know, so it was nice. Uncle Tom, oh, he wanted to go in there so bad. So my man let him go, go, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Had the little, his little boy. You know, you had to have somebody with you. Um, we're never alone. You had to always have, if it was a little girl, she had a little girl, if a little boy, a little boy. So he walked in by himself while the little boy was standing by the door, and all of a sudden he started screaming. This old turkey had walked behind the seats and was open, and he glanced under there and he thought he saw a little worm and bit it. And Uncle Tom was screamed and jumped off. I think he was 18 before he ever went back. <laughs> But that was told at the dinner table every Sunday. <laughs> My man said, you rascals, leave that alone. Y'all are rascals. My grandfather came, his uh, daddy came from Ireland as an indentured bondsman. Okay, I told somebody that the other day. Um, he was Irish. There were a pile of Irish people from New York. And they said, Betty, that wasn't anything but a slave. I said, so what? I'm here. He was captured at Morris Island. It was so contagious, they buried him at 12 o'clock that night. My granddaddy then had to finish raising the children, his brothers and sisters. He planted all the oak trees in Georgetown, and any that lived, he got 15 cents for, for them. I think that's an honor, too. I think that's wonderful. I go and look, and I say his hands were there. You know, his hands were there. Mom and Dad took me uh, one Sunday morning down to Rural Hall at Summer House. And um, they were staying there then. They had moved a big one for the season. And um, so early the next morning, um, all the little uh, children from the further down, closer to the big house, um, they came up. They were going to go huckleberry picking. And uh, I was going to go with them and all that. So I had my little pail and they had theirs and we started down the lane going back toward the big house. And uh, here were these beautiful little black shiny buttons on the, uh, uh, they look like marbles on the road, white sandy road. I said, oh, look, look at the marbles. And I ran with my bucket to pick some up. And some boy said, girl, that goat, that, that goat. I didn't mess with those marbles. <laughs> In fact, I was scared to pick a huckleberry. <laughs> One time, uh, a senator was going, he had been politicking, and um, he came by Rural Hall. That They were at the summer house, and uh, but he came by, and he needed a place to stay, and he was hungry. Well, um, Mene, um, I didn't have any, they didn't, they didn't have any ice down there at, at the summer house um, that I, I can remember, unless they went to the big house, because the ice chest was down there. But anyway, he was hungry, and Mamma had uh, cooked a pot of cornmeal mush for supper. And um, what she did, she sliced it, and she put syrup over it. And he said that was the best darn meal he ever had. But my man cried because, of course, she didn't have a refrigerator. They didn't have those things. You had to eat what you had had. The soldiers came through and uh, burned the plantation, uh, other plantations. But he was treated. They were treated so well at Rural Hall, off the glass of wine. I, that was a smart woman. And uh, well, he went on. You know, they went on. Went on and save that plantation, it wasn't burned. And they thanked them for their hospitality. As a child, um, uh, we all had nurses in the afternoon. 
you know, the, the, the women, they helped clean the house, but in the afternoon they took care of the children. And um, they would take us to the Masonic Temple. And in their courtyard they have um, clover, the white, little white clovers like that. Well, they taught us how to string them, make little things to go around your head, and, and then they go around your neck, and they'd dress us up with the little garlands and the little things on your head. And they would parade us down to the boulevard, about where Judge um, or Morrison's house is now, uh, in that area. And um, it was a, just a little, um, just a little bit of water, enough to say a little creek. You could see the bottom, and it was brown, a kind of a reddish brown, and a lot of cypress trees, I think. But we could see the little crawfish or something down in there, and little minnows. It's a wonder we didn't get to eat up with alligators and snakes, but I, we didn't see any. But it's a wonder we didn't. And uh, But then they would parade us back, you know, to the Masonic Temple and let us run up and down the courthouse steps. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was something we did most all the time. They brought it into the big yard, not by the fence, and uh, they had. Um, I, I saw the um, frames that they had them hanging from, and I saw them boil the lard. You know, I know how to preserve um, um, venison. What you do, and I'll tell you about that first, and then I'll finish with something else crazy of it. Well, anyway, you boil that lard, and you have a glass jar, like a big pickle jar, and um, you put a layer of um, the lard after it is cooled, and then you put your uh, cooked um, meat, like um, meatballs, you lay them flat on that lard, then you take another layer of lard, another layer of meat, another, until you get to the top of the jar, and, and you screw it on real tight. Well, that will last a long time. And I would, I'm would i surprised to even hear that now, that it will. But it, I remember eating it was so good. And um, But anyway, I've seen them um, wash their clothes in an old black boiling pot, you know, and stir them. And, and I know what life soap is. God knows it'll burn your legs up. <laughs> They used to tell me they were gonna wash my mouth. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And um, but anyway, that was really interesting to see. And uh, it and it, they, you sh I know how they. Um, I've seen those hunters um, divide their meat up, their catch after they had butchered. And what they do, they put numbers on little pieces of paper, and you pull your number and that's the piece of meat you get. Then you can't fuss so much about it because you pulled your number. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> they divide the meat up, and I, I know how to make, so I've seen them make sausage, and uh, I've seen my man roll her biscuits in these big old wooden biscuit make, you know, things, bowls. Back in the kitchen, well, pantry was bigger than the kitchen, really. But she had, the, um, uh, three or four picnic tables in the kitchen at night. The, the little children went over there because um, some, you know, it was cold to walk from the dining room over. So when it was cold, we ate in the kitchen at night. But they did have a fireplace for lunchtime in there. Um, but in that pantry, it was the most wonderful, it was the best place you ever saw in your life. It, they had everything. And then they had one wall that um, they canned for the summer times, like peaches and pears and figs and huckleberries, <laughs> all that good stuff. Always had a dessert, and they had a, they loved flowers. They kept fresh flowers in the house in the hall downstairs all the time, and the front of the house was just like the back of the house. But the front of the house is on the river, and it's about um, a city block away from the river because of the rice mites. They had an old jogging boat on the porch next to the river. And they told me one time they wanted to keep me off of it because they were afraid I would break my arm. But I'd sneak around the corner of the house, and one, 
one of the women told me, child, you be careful. Said when they were building this house, somebody fell off and they buried them right there in that spot. <laughs> I don't know if that, I never found out if that was the truth or not, but I didn't go back. <laughs> Oh, and another thing, we sit out on the porch, um, a part of the porch was screened by Papa's bedroom. And um, uh, we would sit at night and we'd listen to the um, whippoorwills and Bob White and something else. But we'd listen to the birds call out. And in the, up at the summer house, we'd sit on the porch and um, we were sitting right under the it was a little sandy road right at the house, almost as close as from here to the road out here to me. And uh, all the trees were there. And um, uh, the pine, that, now there weren't pine trees at, at Rural Hall. I mean, the big house, there were oak trees. But at, at the summer house, it was the pine trees. So Mammy would say, shh, y'all be quiet. So listen to the trees mourn through the breeze, you know, the wind mourn through the trees and we'd have to stop and listen to that. And that's where she taught me the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and I mean, she, she did a lot of teaching in the summertime to us chilling. Across from the summer house was a shed, and Papa had a Model A, a Model T, or some kind of car in there. And uh, we would have to go to the um, ice plant to get ice in the summertime and he'd let me go with him. He had a crowd of people in the in that car. But um, we would go down um, we, uh, Johnson Road, I think, and we'd get on a road called the Brick Chimney Road. No, we would, we have been on, you know, where the, we had been on the Brick Chimney Road a number of times. I don't know if this is the way you get to the Corduroy Road or not. You come out at, um, uh, oh, I can't think of his name, but they had a sawmill and an ice plant there, Tyson. And um, so you could get your sawdust and the ice there. But now going back, uh, there was uh, the road was so boggy and everything, and I just loved it. I loved to get pushed out of those bogs. I thought it was the most fun. But the corduroy road means that um, what they did, they cut the little small pine trees and laid them side, you know, side by side so that you wouldn't sink in that mud. Golly, but it was so much fun, especially when some of the men got splashed. <laughs> I'd laugh, but they would just, they'd laugh too. But we always went and got the ice and um, the sawdust at the same time, because the sawdust keeps the ice from melting. After Papa moved to town, my Uncle Tom took over for a while. He and Aunt Grace Munlin, and um, Aunt Grace was a Munlin before she got married. Well, anyway, I would go spend the night with her a lot of nights, too, play with her china dolls. Beautiful. And, and her daddy had a filling station, and he had a, 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 a I call it a, a um, pond, but it's not. It's a wooden trout, a trough, and he had fish in that, and he'd sell it to people who come by, you know, the fish. But he didn't sell gas to Mr. Munlin. And Uncle Tom was afraid to go out at night. He'd get this colored man and put him in a trunk of the car, <laughs> so he would go with him, because he was afraid to come back by himself. It was daylight when he went, but when he got back to Real Hall, it was dark. But uh, when he started back, uh, well, when he got to his destination, he took him out, you know, and he hung around the store and all, but he was just afraid to travel at night. <laughs> He's crazy. But I, I, I loved him so much, and my cousin did too. He was so handsome. We always said uh, we wanted to be buried in the same coffin with him, but <laughs> not now. <laughs> um, he's, um, he passed away. Um, several of my um, people passed away with um, the Wilson disease. It's, um, it has something to do with your pancreas. So um, several of them have passed away with the same thing. You know, there's not a tree at Rural Hall now. Not a tree. Um, Alfred Sider, whenever he bought it, Mr. Sider, um, he always had a, he also um, had a home at Kensington. But um, he wanted to um, 
cut the property up into, um, you know, for houses and all, but that didn't work out. And um, so that's when Dr. Um, Sloan bought it. They're a nice young couple. But I declare, I told him whenever I left, I said, well, I know my man, grandparents are there. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but I bet they are. You know, that house is old and it used to creak at night whenever we, we would, um, I would sleep on the floor on a mat by my man, Papa. And um, if it was just us, because I wasn't about to go upstairs by myself. And they had one room there they wouldn't let you sleep in because that was called a sick room. And, it, and they would put you there and nobody could go in until you got well. And, um, but anyway, I'd hear the house crack. I guess it might have been the steps or something. And I'd say, what's that? And my man said, That's just, this is just an old house, uh, sweet babe. She said, it's groaning. <laughs> <laughs>